Welcome to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast, where guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. My name's Ryan Rogers, and I'm a big dumb Jurassic Park fan. Welcome to episode 14, Target of Opportunity, recorded here on a hot and sunny weekend on May 15th, 2022. Thanks for joining me today. A continued thank you to Christoph Oaks of Snail. Check out his incredible album on Spotify and Bandcamp. Today's intro is from the song Death of a Dream, and our outro is Sleepyhead. We have some corrections this morning. Um, in terms of the Siege Perilous and the X-Men, I'm almost positive that I didn't get all that quite right in the last episode. How the X-Men used the Siege Perilous and how it's related to their time in Australia and how and when they entered and departed the Reaver's base is a bit of a blur to me, so take all those comments with a grain of salt. I do remember it being very, very cool. So that was those issues all came out around the Uncanny X-Men 250, if you want to go back and check them out. What other mistakes have, uh, have I made? I was wrong about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Let's leave it at that. Uh, also, I was mistaken about Michael Crichton's sci-fi novel Micro. That is not Michael Crichton's sci-fi novel Prey. Uh, the review for Prey is, in the Nevada desert, an experiment has gone horribly wrong. A cloud of nanoparticles, micro-robots, has escaped from the laboratory. This cloud is self-sustaining and self-reproducing. It is intelligent and learns from experience. For all practical purposes, it is alive. Every attempt to destroy it has failed, and we are the prey. Whereas Micro's review is, published posthumously, the only reason you'll make it to page 50 is because Crichton's name is on the cover. The two novels vary in quality, and my sincerest apologies for confusing them. In Dinosaur News, we've got two articles, which again come from our past, although not the deep past, but they were not released recently. The the first here, uh, the National Science Review, published on January 12th, 2020. Yeah, two years ago. The paper, Evidence of Proteins, Chromosomes, and Chemical Markers of DNA in Exceptionally Preserved Dinosaur Cartilage. In the paper, a histological ground section from a hypacrosaurus, which is a duck-billed hadrosaur, revealed microstructures that are a consistent shape as nuclei and chromosomes in cells within calcified cartilage. This fossilization is recognized as exceptional, where the cellular preservation extends to the molecular level, and those fossilized molecular features have commonalities with extant avian cartilage. They did a bunch of tests that I won't pretend to understand, but the results suggest that, quote, endogenous nuclear material, which I'm guessing is the DNA inside the cells of the Hypacrosaurus cartilage, survived fossilization. The authors further hypothesized that, on a molecular level, the cartilage cells had molecular features in common with extant avian cartilage. Their data supports the hypothesis that calcified cartilage is preserved at the molecular level in this hypacrosaurus, and suggests that remnants of once-living cells responsible for cartilage formation, called chondrocytes, including their DNA, may preserve for millions of years. But so what? Well, this sort of means that These researchers have found fossilized DNA from a dinosaur. That DNA fossilizes longer than originally proposed, though they admit that further, quote, extensive research and sequencing is required to further understand DNA preservation in Mesozoic material, along with its chemical and molecular alterations. And not only are scientists finding dinosaur DNA, but also, on top of that, Science.org published in their volume 343, In March 2014, eight years ago, the paper Fossilized Nuclei and Chromosomes Reveal 180 Million Years of Genomic Stasis in Royal Ferns. The paper concedes, yes, the fossilization process tends to destroy fine cell structure, but an exceptional specimen of fossil ferns from the Jurassic period show subcellular structures, including organelles such as nuclei and chromosomes, which are well-preserved. The paper says that comparative and quantitative, which I looked up quantitative and can't find a a definition. Perhaps this means a quantitative analysis, but I don't know. Anyhow, comparative and quantitative analyses show that these cells closely resemble the fossil nuclei of extant cinnamon ferns, scientifically named Osmond Astrum cinnamomia. They're so closely related, it shows that this group of ferns 
has remained virtually unchanged for 180 million years. So, with Hypacrosaurus DNA and now the preserved cytoplasm, cytosol, granules, nuclei, and chromosomes in various stages of cell division from these Swedish ferns, we conclusively have the genetic building blocks to begin recreating the flora and fauna to make our own Jurassic Park. You say, ah, but the ferns are Jurassic and the Hypacrosaurus is late Cretaceous. They cannot mix. To which I say the ferns are unchanged over 180 million years. They were the same in the Jurassic, the same now, and deductively also in the late Cretaceous too, because they are relatively unchanged. And that's what's interesting about this. So modern science is finding the tiny little building blocks of life forms lost many epochs ago. In both of these cases, the specimens are described as, quote, exceptional, and both spend time suggesting, both papers spend time suggesting the specific special circumstances required for that particular fossil to become so exceptionally preserved are necessary because otherwise DNA does not fossilize. And I don't have the paper with me at hand, but I've learned or I've heard that amber is not one of those exceptional circumstances that preserve DNA. So even if blood were in a mosquito and the mosquito were trapped in amber, those circumstances do not preserve DNA. Amber just isn't good like that. Put as an analogy, DNA is like ice cream, amber is like a mini fridge, and exceptional preservation is a freezer. The ice cream only lasts if it's in the freezer, and the freezer is extraordinarily uncommon and only available under exceptional circumstances. You get what I'm trying to say, right? Well, in any case, with the corrections and the dinosaur news out of the way, please let me introduce you to my special guest for this episode. All right, joining me for some fun today is my very special guest. It's Stephen Bull. Steve J. Bull is a host, producer, a comedian, an actor known for Powerboat Television and CBC News Toronto. He's a mountain climber, he's a journalist, he's a boater, and he's a father. How will they fit all that on your tombstone, Steve? <laughs> well, they better not miss any of that. And you missed the most important one. National Delight in Training. <laughs> Do it over, Rick Mercer. That's right. <laughs> so Steve and I met at a support group for people who'd rather be night owls, but have to be up early because we're so pretty they keep putting us on nationally broadcast daily morning television. In that support group, we all sit in a circle and we yawn. <laughs> and... Well, we set our alarms on our phones to, so we can get up early. And to be clear, I'm not there because I'm so pretty, pretty they put me on TV. I was just dropping off donuts. But you <laughs> look like you were definitely wishing you could do late night hits rather than the AM stuff. What's your schedule like these mornings when you had to get up and, and do stuff like the Olympics was incredible? Yeah, well, I didn't know that we were publicizing the multi-snooze crew, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're a strong but powerful group. We will prevail. Yeah, they, so this morning I was up at uh, just after five because I did some hits on the Toronto Raptors incredible playoff run um, on CBC News Network and yeah during the Olympics because of the time changes they were basically the same Beijing and Tokyo but for Tokyo I was living on our boat at the Toronto Islands and so I was commuting over at I think four in the morning I, I back timed it so if I got in the dinghy and cast off at exactly 403 I uh, could get across, tie up at the Dingy Dock City side, get one of the bike share bikes and bike up to the CBC broadcast studio and get up to the fourth floor in time to put on a suit. <laughs> that's like <laughs> so that'll wake you up. That's like Muskoka life meets city life all shoved into before 6 a.m. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the way to have the cottage lifestyle, but if you're too lazy to commute. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I don't know. I that's, fall. that's a commute, man. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, like that was the best wake up though, because you know you can't be even if it's bad conditions. Like a bad day boating is better than a good day working. <laughs> uh, yeah. So <laughs> coming across at four one in the mornings, it was like windy and cold, and I had I was wearing this survival suit. I would normally just wear a you know inflatable life jacket, but they have these big ones that like it's like a, a parka filled with inflatable or floatable flotation stuff <laughs> and it's bright yellow so okay. you would wear it if you're like fishing or something like that and it, it would keep you afloat and visible so I just wore it for warmth because it was so cold and uh, whatever the Olympics were August and uh, I'm not a morning person at all as you said so <laughs> ripping across with that fresh air I'm like I like I bounded into the newsroom and everyone thought something was up they're like are you on some sort of medication <laughs> because normally you're like just dragon when you come in and i was like hey guys how's it going what, what a great day <laughs> how are you 
That's right. The Steve Bowl that was my roommate 20 years ago, his early morning alarms were set for only like 8.30 or something like that. But you needed an air raid siren because they would not wake you up. And we would all be like hammering on your door. <laughs> the, remember that time I got that new stereo and it had the alarm button and they went off for an hour, like full blast. I was asleep the whole time. And I woke up and I was like pissed off because like all my roommates and alleged friends <laughs> let me sleep. Through it, and they were like, "We were trying to get in." <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you do now? What alarm do you set now that suddenly wakes you up? Oh, uh, I think becoming a father like connected something in my brain to be like, "All right, you probably should get up. You have another human being you're responsible for." Like, not all the time. Like, if my uh, wife is like, if it's a weekend, she's a morning person, so she'll be like, "Ah, you know, you just get more sleep." And then you take over in the evening when I'm fading and you can do the book reading and stuff. Mm -hmm. So those mornings, I just, I don't hear anything. But, you know, this morning when I was doing the solo parenting as well, um, the alarm goes and I'm like, ah, it's just the iPhone alarm. It's magic, baby. <laughs> well, there you go. We just needed uh, Apple to solve our problems before we knew we had them. <laughs> <laughs> so what made you want to come on to a Jurassic Park podcast with me? What made you, what made you this sound like a good idea? two things number one i heart you all right and anything you do is be entertaining interesting or uh thought-provoking or potentially all three so i knew it was going to be a good time and i mean i like the movie i remember i distinctly remember seeing it in the theater when i was 12 and i was terrified like i left the theater to quote unquote go to the bathroom and then my dad was it's like a T-Rex scene. He's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm coming back. Um, he's like, yeah, you were in here a while. And I think I walked out and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it was right after the lawyer. Um, and you hear like the crunching of the bones. Yeah. So as a 12 year old, I didn't watch like gory movies. That was uh, next level. I still loved it. And then my son now, who's just turned, well, not just, but he's six years old. Mm -hmm. He loves it. He's, he's seen like, you know, there's the cartoon ones and like a cartoon Lego one but yeah no he's seen all of the actual movies uh which gets me some odd looks at the playground when we're talking about hey what kid you know what movies did you watch with your kid mm -hmm. oh jurassic world is his favorite <laughs> what yeah the one with the indominus rex like you can't get enough of it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i see him on the playground you know aliens 3 was not as good as aliens or alien they mostly come out at <laughs> night mostly he's quoting this all over the playground <laughs> like he's six i can't yeah. believe it <laughs> well, that's good. We also watched. The, um, I came home and he was watching with my father-in-law The Dark Knight, and then the next day at the playground, he was telling everyone. I'm like, why don't we just not tell everyone? He's like, I felt really sad for the Joker because everyone was mean to him. I'm like, that's your takeaway? <laughs> what if you Jurassic Park? <laughs> he had boo boos on his jaw. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness! Did he? He didn't talk like this, did he? Afterwards. <laughs> No, I did uh, until yeah. I got stressed. Yeah, a few people. You can't did. do a Batman voice. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm Batman. You mentioned too that you began the book once upon a time, but uh, it didn't it didn't pan out. What what's a, what happened with your ambition to, so, to read the novel? It was shortly after seeing the must have, like would have been shortly after seeing the movie, and then I was keen. I think my brother had it, so I had to wait for him to finish. Mm -hmm. It took a little while. I mean, it's one of those things that like kid logic makes perfect sense. Be but when I look back at it now, I'm like, there were libraries. There were there was more than one. Yeah. Like, it wasn't we're waiting for Gutenberg to press out another one for <laughs> us to read. <laughs> so I was just like, man, I can't read the book till he's done. Um, and I wouldn't dare take it while he was reading it and try to do it. So I don't I don't even know if I finished. I'm I don't remember it. The only the only clear memory from the book versus the films is i believe the opening like all the the little dinosaurs and a baby or something like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and i think they touched on that in one of the movies at the beginning it's like sort of similar but it was like a big private yacht thing anyway um yeah i don't even i don't know why i uh i sadly was not a recreational reader for many many years Mm -hmm. And then I was in the Da Vinci Code as an extra, and so I bought the book on the way back, and I read it the whole thing, um, in by the next night. So it's in you. Off my, 
the the passion <laughs> to read is there. You just need to be. They just get got to give you a part first. I don't have any roles, so until they do, mm -hmm. I'm not reading that damn thing, Crichton. <laughs> What'd you think of the Da Vinci Code when you uh, read that? I loved it. I guess I could see why the you know some of the literary circuit would critique it, but I'm of the viewpoint of you know. Nobody ever put that up and said, this is a monster of literature. It was like, this is an entertaining peach turner. And there ain't nothing wrong with that. So, yeah, it was, uh, I, I found it, it, and I like history. And I had, uh, I was at the point of backpacking around Europe. So mm -hmm. a lot of the places they were mentioning, I was like, oh, I'm going to Paris next weekend. I'm like, I'm going to walk by that church. Well, oh, look, there's the rose line. Um, people gave Stephen King a hard time too. Like, there's something about people like novels that capture your imagination and and tell you a great story that is worth it, even if it's not great art. I mean, there's something to be said for it being yeah. connect connecting with you and giving you a real adventure and making you feel like wow, like an event. It's a, it's something to go on in an adventure while just reading a book. That guys like Stephen King, Dan Brown, and Crichton, of course, they do it. And for people to poo poo them to say, eh, but it's not great, is beside the point you know what i mean yeah <laughs> and yeah think... exactly I, and you know i feel the pop culture in general just gets crapped on by a lot of people because it's easy to do but the idea of entertaining and appealing to the masses um in a genuine way where it is genuinely entertaining um is not easy to do so like no. Uh, yeah, it's like, so the music fine that it's manufactured, but like there are producers behind it that have like figured out this is what people want to hear. Um, and if it was so simple yeah. to just churn out a song, every friend of ours that has a guitar <laughs> would have a hit song, but they don't because it's, even though it all sounds the same, it's a lot harder than it sounds. And yeah, a book, it doesn't have to be Pulitzer winning or Giller prize worthy to be meaningful and there's nothing wrong with being entertained <laughs> like we all do you ever leave a conversation and be like you know <laughs> I that person but i had a good time so it was pretty fluff <laughs> no. what a fluffy conversation yeah <laughs> what in, in, I guy told a joke. What a loser! <laughs> and in, in music, and, you're right. You, they, you can make a music, or songs can be written. They they seem to do it uh, where they reach the masses. And they've got in film, they can make these movies and they connect with the masses. But there's a way to generally appeal to a broad audience, which books almost never do. Bestsellers are in incredibly small in terms of the audiences they reach, and the very rare, rare phenomena become the Harry Potters that become accessible to almost all or what Jurassic like even people who love Jurassic Park have not read the book I was talking to one friend never heard of the book like it's incredible <laughs> and uh and that's just how it is but it's amazing how movies can do it music can do it television can sometimes do it but it's incredibly difficult for a book to do and when they do it is something special and even if it's not mm. super duper you know it's not Shakespeare or something like that it, it's still something to be it's wonderful to go on the journey and I think this book does it. The movies do it. It's incredible. Well, I think that's well said. It is rare. Like the Harry Potter, that's why they call them phenomenons, right? Versus music and, and things like that that you sort of expect. But no one right now is walking out the door thinking like, well, I'm going to just go swing by the closest bookstore and <laughs> get the newest blockbuster. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're not coming out every month. Yeah, the Black Eyed Peas um, aren't writing novels. <laughs> <laughs> So they spell a lot of words in their songs, so maybe she has them all. <laughs> they tell you what year it is. Things like that. Important things. They really anchor yeah. it into cultural uh, obscurity. Yeah. Let's get into what your son loves about the fourth one. You called it... He says he loves Jurassic World. What was it about Jurassic World that you've seen that he seems to appreciate the best? Well, the, the interesting thing in watching with a uh, six-year-old is one that's through a new lens, mm -hmm. and then I'll entertainingly they all kind of get mashed up because so i was asking him about it i said yeah i want to do you know my friend got this podcast about jurassic park and he was all excited i'm like i'm not actually going and there is no jurassic park like, for real and he's like right yeah it's a movie but the people were real right anyway so there's aspects of that that get mixed up his favorite parts are uh with blue the mm -hmm. raptor that's trained and and that hierarchy um, and 
we also have been watching some like nature documentaries because that's my justification of well I'm fine if I'm in a cave and give them screen time like on a extra screen time on a school night if it's at least bathed in education then I feel <laughs> fine about it so okay. <laughs> watching things like that and so he's like oh yeah that's like when we saw the uh the lions on the documentary they're all in a pack um and then just the the giant was it the indominus rex yeah the, the made up one by the crazy doctor who started off nice and smart and then like as as the different series go on like sometimes he's this maniacal madman mm -hmm. uh, and then you know like he likes the little ball rolly thingy yeah the uh, gyrosphere i think they were called yeah but he just really loves when the the dinosaurs are on like he'll kind of look away when when they first jump but like he wants to watch it yeah <laughs> so like he like there's not enough dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. If would probably be his review. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. What about you? What did you like about it when uh, when you look back on? You say you watch it with a new lens or as an adult. Like you, you can. Yeah. It's amazing how you can reapproach Jurassic Park. You remember when you were twelve, but of course yep. when you see it again, it's amazing. Like there's a scene up in the tree where Grant's with the two kids, and when you're twelve, you're the kid, and when you're yep. a dad, you're Grant. And it's, you see the scenes entirely differently from a totally different perspective. That's what I thought anyhow. And I can't imagine that's uncommon. So what do you think? No, I, I think the, I, I, the, that's exactly how it, I, I would put it. And that scene is a great one. Um, I mean, that whole, their whole relationship. Yeah. When I watched it, I was mm -hmm. thinking of like little Timmy and oh, I'd be so cool to have this, you know, dr grant around that'd be like because there's like there's no worries like oh man this is scary but well what's dr grant gonna tell him to do yeah as if the grown-up has all the answers mm -hmm. in every situation and now you know when i rewatched it there are aspects where you like look at the kids and you're like oh for god's sakes would you just listen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, or you know yeah you watch it from that and you have a little more of a protective view and uh and then I'll always you know the the little not errors but little whole plot holes whatever they are mm. uh which you wouldn't have paid attention to but because i've seen it so much like when little timmy's climbing the fence i'm like those holes are clearly big <laughs> enough for you to just step right through like you don't need to go 30 feet up grant sure <laughs> <laughs> or when the the truck gets pushed off from the t-rex visiting pen and it's like suddenly a 50 foot drop yeah and like, Did just have a goat on the ground there and then the <laughs> just walked through that that's how the fence is broken. That just seem those seem weird that they slip through, but and it's like a classic adventure story, right? Like yeah. But even I, I remember when I was a kid, um, being really scared too. And I didn't leave the theater. <laughs> I just wet myself in, right in the seat. But uh, I remember the opening scene with the bushes shaking and then the the raptor in the in the holding pen. I remember thinking to myself, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to watch the rest of this movie, like. I, I'm a big guy. It's PG-13. I'll live through it. I'll be all right. It's going to be fine. And then I remember just that first moment. I was like, maybe, maybe I overestimated how great I am because this is tough. <laughs> and uh, that was crazy. Um, and then what else really got me? The 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 kitchen scene where she's trying to get the that oh, lid God. down. I was like, this is it. <laughs> she's toast. <Yeah. laughs> she ain't going to make it. I remember yeah. that really yeah. got me. And... Uh, yeah, there were some moments I was like really, really uh, affected as a as a youth watching that one. That's for sure. And I hear about people who are like, oh, I saw it when I was four. Is like, can you really appreciate like the terror of <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what's going on here? That's why I actually think I was actually it was an accidental genius parenting move to let him watch it so young mm -hmm. because yeah, like he he gets it, but it's not like, but not to that level. Like it's not replacing reality um everything on tv like someone in his class last year when i was doing the olympics um we'd meet them at like the school playground or whatever and this little girl a year younger so it was a jksk split anyway i'm in the weeds here but she was like how are you in the box and then and like the tv is like where all the the show people are like how did you get in there and how did you get back out here to come to the playground so like not that that's where my son is but that's that's 
close to that whole world, right? Where they're like, that's how removed from reality it is. But when you're a little older and you're like, the bushes are rattling and, the, <laughs> and the guy just goes vertically up, shoot them down. And you're like, oh my God, they're eating them. <laughs> yeah. um, and when they're in the, um, they're going to turn the power back on. Mm -hmm. That one's still like, I get a, a jump in the good way when the raptor jumps out. Little, yes, yeah. That was another one. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it just jumps out of there. It's a big scare. There are a lot of good jump scares in that one. The last yeah. scene that I remember in my head where it wasn't even a dinosaur thing is when the car lands out of the tree and it starts totter, uh, tipping onto Timmy. And I was like, well, yeah. he's done. He's just got squished. And then it lands just right <laughs> so that he's back in the car again and he and Grant are okay. And he says, well, we're back in the car again. It's like, wow, they just took all of that tension. And then there's that little joke at the end and it, it's perfect. That's, there's nothing worse than being that anxiety ridden and then being cleared and there's a little joke and that scene just, it doesn't even have a dinosaur in it, but it's so great because you get a huge roller coaster of emotions through it, especially as a, a young, I thought he was dead. <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> well, that's the thing, like going back to the earlier point about appealing to the masses and stuff like that is hard to do. And so, yeah, like you could say, if you're around like a table and you're writing this crazy dinosaur movie billy and the clonosaurus um <laughs> you're like all right well now they've done this whole thing and they're you know they climbed down and they avoided the truck falling um how do we resolve this scene like to come up with the, like oh okay well it's this kind of tree where the roots are higher and it, it'll fall and with the crushed in roof they'll be safe and then we cut it with this <laughs> line who says it? And then like, well, no, not Grant. It's funniest if it comes from the kid. Yeah. And he says it in a like detached from, hey, we almost died a bunch of times. Too. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell my little joke. So like you watch it and you're like, oh, yeah, it's so obvious. But it's <laughs> go write that scene. Yeah. Yeah. But some of that stuff, you know, there's a lot goes into it. Some of it's planned, some of it's ad libs and all that. So um, well, but it all gets like knocked down. So that's why like it's bothered me, not just as a uh, very low level like first rung of the comedy <laughs> ladder stand-up comedian that like comedy movies are never nominated for awards mm -hmm. uh, like we my wife and i rewatched the bridesmaids on the weekend mm -hmm. and that as like to have for a comedy movie to have laugh out loud moments on rewatching when you know what's coming so yeah. it's not just relying on the shock of a, a turn and the, the phrasing um, or a surprise reveal is really hard to do. And then they also have a good story throughout to keep you interested because no one's going to watch two hours of mm -hmm. unhinged jokes. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, unless you, you're watching the Netflix special. You know what movies just like that is Office Space. You know all the jokes that are coming and you're in tears before they even hit. <laughs> yeah. I what would you say to do here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no lines that I can repeat that are suitable for this podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that being said, uh, adding comedic timing and little uh, humorous elements to a film is wonderful, especially when you're trying to make something that's a little bit more accessible, especially when you're trying to make something that's um, PG. You you took some of that Second City training, which is awesome. How do um, what, what sort of lessons do you learn about? especially from second like does eugene levy come in like just he gives you the the chat <laughs> with a with a with a special magazine and <laughs> yeah and the birds and the bees and uh there are some bees that like bees and that's okay uh, <laughs> but the no I, I think they do stuff like that for the improv so there's sort of two main sides to the, the training center um well not sides but streams i guess there's the improv which is the, the main one and what they're famous for and we're mm -hmm. mike and all those guys and then um i did a, it's a fairly new side of it stand-up comedy and they have trained comedians and so the guy who's my instructor evan carter he's awesome by the way i think he's headlining at absolute comedy this summer i don't know look right him on. up good dude funny <laughs> um and like so his intro to us was you know i don't think a single one of you in this room know my name i don't get stopped walking down the street like a celebrity, but I've been a professional stand-up since 1984. I've put my kids through school, paid my mortgage. So if I give you advice, let's just say I know what I'm talking about. And so I love that because it was not an accurate analogy, but a blue collar 
yeah. comedian, like in the working sense, where it's like, you know, I'm going to go out there and I've got to do the shows to get the money. I'm not doing a million dollar Netflix special and just hanging out in LA. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned from him and then talking to other comics, cause you get, you know, you're in the green room and you're chatting and you strike up like friendships and you'll see someone at another open mic night when you're starting out and like, Oh yeah. Hey, you did that joke again. You really tightened it up. And so <laughs> for the most part, it's a weird, like, so the whole comedians and cars is getting coffee with Jerry Seinfeld. I get a lot more cause there is a, a weird little sort of bond in that regard where mm -hmm. you're competing like you know there's only so many paying gigs and things like that but you're not ripping off each other's material that's like a huge no-no mm -hmm. um nobody does it and so then there's no threat of it so then if someone has a good joke like you'll help them work on their thing because it's not like a tangible object that if they can't figure it out you can you can t pick it pick it up so just like yeah the, the <laughs> finally circling circling back to your question uh, just the working in it, like um, taking a joke and trying it over and over again. And so sort of that's part of the, the art of the performance that you might do the exact same five minute set. And that's actually what they advise. They're like, so we, the, the whole thing of that class we work on five minutes, do that set and do the exact same one at a few different places because mm -hmm. one audience is never going to tell the full picture. Um, maybe they're a particularly laughy, happy group and you think you killed it and then you go somewhere else and oh, it turns out you're garbage and they're all just like they're drunk because it's a bachelorette party. And then start swapping in other jokes and seeing what works. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's supposed to like, so when you see a comic on stage, it seems all loosey goosey, like they're just someone at a party holding a cocktail and yapping away. But like they have worked that around whatever natural. Mm -hmm abilities that they would have and play up but like they've worked that material to the point that you know even if they do ad lib or interact with the audience like they know generally what they're doing like there's very few yeah. that are just like oh oh 15 minutes yeah i guess let me just try all just, new stuff i've never thought of before just riffing for yeah and you're right there must be an incredibly practiced performative element to it to look like you're just riffing with incredibly well rehearsed material <laughs> That's been workshop. So, yeah. like when you say that he was blue collar, like your mentor was, um, sounds like he took a very business like approach, even though it, it mm. never looks like that. It's a behind the stage or behind the scenes element that, uh, that people don't appreciate, maybe. <laughs> but the other thing I remember hearing about Second City was that there, there's a real element, especially with improv, and maybe this doesn't relate entirely, but there's an element about being vulnerable and and talking about maybe things that you would never talk about because that's how you get to that nerve where people get uncomfortable and then you can really spin it for for a laugh and when you say that there's a, a brethren among comedians i think that they've all exposed themselves in a way that maybe they can only relate to not a lot of people get up on stage and just talk about stuff that they wouldn't want to share if it weren't for the sake of trying to get a laugh out of it like that's incredibly uh, humbling material to work with sometimes yeah and it is it is weird like so i've had a lot of people say you know pre-pandemic when i was working full-time and now i'm working on other projects and just occasionally working with cbc but they'd be like oh well stand-up's got to be no big deal for you because for eight hours a day you're on live television i'm like it, it, it's very different and it's way scarier the only time i get nervous before public speaking or anything. And yeah, like live TV does not phase me anymore. Like, and that's only cause I've done it for years. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm special, but like I've worked that. Yeah. Um, and all of those sort of things where, you know, you do, you put in the 10,000 hours, whatever you want to call it, flex the muscle. Um, then it's just second nature, but then just because it's talking and performing, it's very different. Like, so that same instructor had a great line about the arrogance of stand-up comedy as an art form. We call it the, I think you refer to it as the, the purest and the most arrogant. And by that he means, at the heart of it, it's just the only equipment is a microphone simply to make your voice louder. There's no yeah. prop music, even though some people do that. Like in general, stand-up is just, I'm gonna say these things. He goes, so it's just words. And then it's those, and with those words, what you're attempting to do is manipulate a group of individuals emotions on your whim because you are building this joke so what you need to do is find a way to word it 
So you engage with all these people that haven't lived your experience, um, that haven't experienced whatever you're talking about, and you're going to have them all have a simultaneous reaction that is not planned. It's not like, okay, I want everyone mm -hmm. to stand up and tell them and everyone will do it. Like you're going to elicit an emotional reaction <laughs> when you want. Uh, and I was like, oh, when you break it down like that, that scares me way more. <laughs> <laughs> You guys do refunds, um, but he's right. And, and yeah, so there's there's something about it. And yeah, some people are able. What does that show? Uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, that's what you know. She does. She goes up on stage and talks about personal life and yeah. stuff that you would never do. Yeah, an emotional alchemist. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's gold, Jerry. <laughs> I would love to tell a joke that got everybody to stand up and do something. That'd be, <laughs> instead of just laughing, they actually got up and like threw a dollar at me or something. That'd be just wild. Um, so how about boating questions? How many, how many years have you spent on boat? How did you get into boats? Yeah, this was a weird one. Um, so my dad and stepmom had a cottage in yeah, Huntsville area yeah. um, up there. So it was, you know, and then eventually in a couple years after they got it, they bought, I don't even know what the model is it was like just generic boat okay some old like something from the 60s i think because this was the late 90s or sorry late 80s uh it was like 80 88 or 89 they got their first boat and it was like 20 years old with like a chrysler motor and they don't make them anymore and there's no name on the boat i looked at a picture i've asked a bunch of people i'm like what is this nobody knows they're like yeah that's just a, it's a it's a boat um it's blue and so like it was just smaller boats and things like that and my aunt and uncle ended up getting a place on like Simcoe when they retired and they had a little boat like a 20 footer but around well it was just after so my wife grew up boating her dad had fishing charter business on the Great Lakes and sold boats for a while so she grew up on boats and they're family friends that's how we met and like to me a 26 foot boat with like a, a tiny little cuddy cabin was a gigantic yacht. So we yeah. I remember seeing the boat one time. We went for a road trip to Erio. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is huge. So she like grew up in the marina life and the boating lifestyle. And I was a very quick convert for that. So like to take me to a couple marinas and go to the marina restaurant and bar, bar, have a drink, look at all the boats. And I was like, I got live music here tonight. She's like, yeah, these are fun places. <laughs> all right yeah i mean let's get a boat so then i was still with i was full-time with cbc news at the time and we bought our boat a 2001 c ray 380 sundancer so it's 38 feet long and 13 feet wide and that was the first boat i bought <laughs> right we on. bought and i got so a question a sexist question i'll apply <laughs> i would get it at cbc was like wait a minute you guys rent an apartment, and instead of saving to buy a house, you bought a big boat? I'm like, yeah, it's going to be like a floating cottage. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my God, how would you talk your wife to that? It was her idea. <laughs> oh, and so after we had bought the boat, like two months after, I, by fluke, saw the listing, like posting for Powerboat Television was seeking a co-host and associate producer to mm -hmm. replace one of the two that was leaving. So in my cover letter, I talked about my boating history, um, and I never lied because I believe in karma. <laughs> um, I just creatively highlighted certain facts, which were, I am the owner of a 38 foot <laughs> power boat and we had secured the marina we were at. And so I said, yeah, we own a. 380 Sun Dancer, and as of this year, we will be keeping it at Toronto Island, <laughs> and that'll be our our home on the on the islands. Um, if they and then I had the interview, I did fess up at that point. At the end, I said, you know, I should note if you asked me how many hours have you driven <laughs> 38, I would say none. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even been on it without a tarp on mm -hmm. in the winter. So yeah, then I, th that happened and so it was going to be, we were going to split the boat driving 50, 50. And I was like, I got to do all of it because I'm going to be testing boats and mm -hmm. on 
boats like that that are brand new and are worth like a million or two. <laughs> Imagine. Um, I'm comfortable driving a big boat. <laughs> and yeah, then it just, I, I did that show for five years. So it was all over North America. The farthest north was Yellowknife. The farthest west was the Colorado River. Well, no, I went to uh, Seattle in my last year. And, but there were some cool places like Arizona, Lake Havasu City. That's where uh, London Bridge was bought and moved to by the guy that created Lake Havasu City. And they moved it brick by brick. And now it's just there. Um, <laughs> it was originally built and I think it's 18, 1799 or 1800 and was there until the 60s. Um, yeah, it's now on this man-made lake going to a little island. Weird. I, think, I don't know if there's a Hooters out there or something. I don't know what there is. <laughs> but yeah, it's like this crazy boat culture like there everyone has a boat and it's in the middle of the desert like it's a two-hour drive from vegas mm -hmm. um yeah so i did that for a little bit and then um i left that a year before the pandemic which is now a funny sort of marker in everyone's mm -hmm. timeline mm -hmm. how long have you had your car oh, i got it like two months before the pandemic i left to work on some other projects and then just recently and launching so powerboat television is no more the uh, owner retired and i'm starting a show that uh, i'm talking with global about basically replacing the powerboat tv time slot on global on saturday mornings so if all goes well when this airs we're only a couple weeks away from episode one first weekend in july so hopefully it all comes together. But if not, then it's just, you know, Amazing. fake news. Um, <laughs> we're up there with Joe Rogan. Um, as far as some people will complain, you should inject horse tranquilizer into your cats mm -hmm. because it'll... It will de it will deworm your pets. It's good. Lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so no, there's like a new show focusing on yeah, the boat life. So uh, that's cool. Waterway, that's good. It. So uh, one of the things about Jurassic Park that... Um, is problematic is that they I, i'm not sure how guests get from wherever on earth i guess on in, on costa rica on the west coast a hundred miles through open ocean to the island now in the movie they hop in a, a little helicopter and even it has trouble landing there i don't know how they're going to get i don't know how many guests to go there but presumably they would take a ferry now in the book they didn't put in a storm breaker for the um for the harbor so it actually has to ferry back and forth and it can't land in, in bad weather but i mean it's it's a tough spot so what kind of boat would you recommend <laughs> ferrying people a hundred a hundred miles through open ocean into a, a weak little harbor uh, be, you'd have to take rowboats or something i guess that'd be kind of a fun way to do it but what would you recommend well the classic way and sweet segue by the way yeah yeah um you probably looked at the bio and you're like, oh my God, why can't I talk veterinarian? <laughs> um, you got to go with a catamaran, one of those big ones that like does okay. the English channel. That'd be good. But then, yeah, if it's a small harbor, there are these really cool boats. They don't, I don't know how many people they'd be able to fit, but they do custom ones. You should actually Google it after. I have no connection to these people. It's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. So they're made in Ireland, I believe in Cork called safe haven marine um and they started i believe making pilot boats so uh like for the welland canal or some aspects of the san Lawrence seaway anyway a lot of harbors you have to have a specifically trained captain who then physically takes control of the bridge and pilots the giant ship to wherever so for the welland canal for example you either have to have certain transport canada clearances or something like that really no exactly and if not like so if it's an international ship then a pilot goes out and they'll have the boats because like this huge freighter is not going to like pull up to the town dock and have someone climb on <laughs> so these boats go out right up beside it and the guys climb a ladder and then and they physically control and tell the crew what to do and when they get to the other side off they go interesting so, um like the the seas around ireland can be crazy so they have these all weather boats because you know ships cross the Atlantic it's not just going to sit out in a storm being like oh let's wait till it's a little mm -hmm. a little nicer to get into the safe harbor um so they have these all weather boats and they're insane like they test them in 30 foot waves 
Wow. So you'd see people surf in mega waves and they're just like boating through <laughs> it and they're like self writing if they go upside down. So I'm trying to get a ride on one of them. That's that's my segue. All right, episode two of the un- unnamed show. Yes. So yeah. uh, Steve needs a budget to go to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big Irish uh, audience listener base, right? So <laughs> Safe Haven Marines listening, give your boy a call. So a catamaran, and then have somebody that would actually be a pro that so they 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 ferry out to your your vessel board take hold of the, uh, the bridge and then bring it into safe Harbor. Yeah. Just like that. That's interesting. Okay. They could be done then. And you have the go fast boat. So when everything goes crazy and mm-hmm. the dinosaurs escape and you got to get out of there, you're not putting away on a little lobster boat. Well, they don't plan for that. <laughs> they always plan they for it. No, 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 it'll be fine. Do the, you think the, zoos have like, if the tigers get out emergency so plan, what happens if, the, if the fence fails or there's like a land slide and the fence goes down and the tiger's out yeah i think the plan is a rifle isn't it i mean that's what they do <laughs> but it's just it's canada they're not gonna have that many guns that handy they've got to be like locked up somewhere and i don't know that gorilla that snagged the kid harambi or what was his name yeah but what? that was in the states that's the land of the lock uh, there you go okay i don't know good. that's plan b um, man plan b is lethal force i'm pretty sure at the zoo I couldn't be sure. I, the zoo has turned me down so far. They said they are not presently available to talk about Jurassic Park. <laughs> I'm not joking. No, I have to boycott them now. They, they said they're overcommitted right now. <laughs> uh, but I tried. I you tried. But you just said Canada, Canada geese on them. <laughs> Soon enough. So... Um, You've had a chance. You said you were in the Da Vinci Code. You've been in a, a couple documentaries. You've been in a couple home reno shows. You've been in a bunch of stuff, which is yeah. cool. I'm a mile wide and an inch deep. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a chance, if you had a chance to play a character uh, on, on any of the films in Jurassic Park, uh, which Ooh. would your son be most delighted to see you show up as? He would probably be most delighted if I were. Your arm falls on Ellie's shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Steve, it's you. <laughs> um, no, not the arm. Probably either Alan Grant or... Um, no, you know what his favorite is? Uh, Owen, Chris Pratt's character. Yeah, Owen Don't Grady. Frame the Raptors. That'd be good. My pick would be um, Dr. Ian Malcolm. Yeah. I don't a weird, like, slip up and call him Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took 10,000 hours for these dinosaurs to come there. <laughs> That'd be Can interesting. About the Stegosaurus. There was a character in the book. His name was Ed Regis, and he was a marketing guy. And he was supposed to be doing all the fun stuff. And he, um, he had like a, a, a Mets baseball cap and he kind of was being employed to take care of the kids, even though he had other things he was supposed to be doing. And I think not that you are like Ed Regis. I think you would play really good Ed Regis <laughs> in terms of he'd rather be doing something else. He's pissed off the whole time. He doesn't want to be having these kids still going around and then he gets eaten by a Tyrannosaurus. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you'd have, you would make a terrific Ed Regis in the film guaranteed. So when they reboot it in, a couple, well, hopefully soon. <laughs> want to start a Twitter campaign. What would they do for the next film? Like, so they've this next one. It sounds like they've got a lot of stuff planned that we're going to lift out of the the first book as well. That so Nedry was hired by a guy named Doctor Lou Dodson to uh, to perform industrial espionage and steal Not the embryos, true. right? <laughs> So that, in the book, they say the reason he's using his uh, his name out loud all the time is because he's trying to record the conversation so he can keep him honest about getting the rest of his money at the end of the movie, even though he doesn't make yeah. it. But that's why he's being so vociferous about Dodson's name, which yeah. is an interesting detail. But anyhow, as far as I understand, the next film will be about Biosyn will, in some ca- capacity, also have dinosaurs now. So there will be another... Enterprise, bioengine, biotechnology enterprise that will be in charge of dinosaurs. And however that goes, I don't know. But well, that'll be an interesting connection to see yeah. how it all plays together. Yeah, now I got to find land the role of Ed Regis. 
It would have been fun if they had brought characters and stuff that they hadn't used yet and put it into new yeah. fran- episodes. But, I mean, I don't know. It would be interesting. So when they bring in Dodson, that guy will be presumably played by the same actor that was, we got Dodson here. He's got to be 70-something as well. Like, <laughs> why this guy hasn't retired from, from uh, right. corporate industrial espionage, I don't know. But <laughs> It'd be strange to see all these things go together. Yeah, the other way... And let's put this down now, and now it's our idea, and we will develop it and make hundreds of dollars. Is a prequel, mm-hmm. we'll show like the building of the park and the initial failures, because you know they like allude to that stuff, and then you could build in a lot of those other book moments. Might have to tweak them a little bit, but and have it where it's supposed to be culminating with the grandkids' arrival. Yeah, because uh, what's his name? Um, Hammond is gone, right? Like he flies out to their dig site. So yeah. the end of the movie, he's not even there when things are going crazy, and no one has the guts to tell him it's not ready for your grandkids. Right. Just, it writes and resolves itself. That'd be crazy. So other than Jurassic Park, I found that when the kids get into stuff that you also liked when you were little, and you go back and check it out again, it's a lot of fun because you want them to be as excited about it as you were. And so Jurassic Park was one of them. I wanted the kids to be into like the Ninja Turtle movies, and they are. The Ninja Turtles cartoon is bad. <laughs> like it's it doesn't make a lick of sense. It's so corny. I don't think they had writers on the show. It was just the theme song and that intro were amazing, and then the rest of it was B roll. It was so bad. But um, have you found other things where you like you got back into it because because your son's into it and it's been wonderful, or is it? Have you found anything like, I can't believe I liked this one as well. Like Pee Wee's Big Adventure, amazing. It still holds okay. up. It's still a wonderful movie. The kids liked it when they were yeah. six-ish. And uh, we haven't listened to it in a while, but Shelly's like, you, you can't do this because then they start repeating the lines. <laughs> I, had, yeah, I, had, right. I had Sullivan going, I'm trying to use the phone. <laughs> <laughs> and Shelly's like, you got to stop watching the movie. They can't stop. They can't control themselves. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, there are some, like at the beginning of the pandemic, we would do a movie a day on, we got the Disney Plus app, so it's like all the old classic, like Sleeping Beauty, Mm -hmm. all those. Um, And I remember watching them as a kid, being at friends, how that would be like, they had all the VHS, it was like displayed, pride of place, and I was like, how come we don't have all the Disney movies? You don't love us. (laughs) Um, How come we're poor? Uh, That was like the sign, and the thicker cases they weren't just a regular size vhs one, right. right it was like a big plastic thing anyway so a lot of those didn't quite hold up and i was like uh oh. but then we started letting them watch some more like 80s movies uh like back to the, the back to the future trilogy mm-hmm. i've seen that not the second one as much he really liked the third one with the cowboys okay he was four. and now he likes the first one the most but i've seen those like that trilogy a good five to somewhere between five to ten times, depending on which <laughs> one of the three. Top Gun, he really likes. Um, really? Okay. Yeah. I tried Days of Thunder, not really so much. He doesn't like all the smooching parts. Mm hmm. Or when the cops frisk him? <laughs> Why is the cop frisking him at the, the thing? Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> well, like any of those movies, there's like outdated references and like yeah. Biff calls Marty butthead all the time. So like I was wondering, I'm like, dude, you cannot say this at school because yeah. you will get in trouble from them and from me. And then you won't be allowed to watch any of There's this. a couple Bill and Ted's uh, excellent adventure, uh, monster squad. That. There's a couple of them where like, Oh man. Yeah. You can't say these things anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what a bummer. Yeah. Like even in, um, it's actually worked out. We talked about, uh, so in back to the future three, they go back and, you know, we talked about the term Indian because they use that all the time. He's like, why are they calling them Indians? I'm like, well, here's why. <laughs> um, and, but it's good because like they do land acknowledgement at school. So like, yeah. it's not a foreign concept to them. The like rude part is like, I had to have a talk with them on the weekend because we were playing music uh, when we were, we were playing Monopoly and I just had like some streaming, like an Apple music playlist going it was like hits of the 90s and a couple like 
Notorious B.I.G. songs came on. And yeah. I was like, hey, there's a word in here that you're going to hear in a new song <laughs> you can never, ever, ever say. And, like, this is a, a no-strike rule. Like, you say it once, you're in trouble. <laughs> and then afterwards, I was like, you know, I didn't think that was a talk that we would be having right now. But I was like, I don't know. I just heard it, like, three times in a song. And I know he's trying to learn songs and sing them along. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't want to sing in that at school. Yeah. I know how you feel. Oh. Like uh, Tom Petty passed away. We cranked Tom Petty for ages around here. DMX passed away. We cranked DMX for 20 seconds. <laughs> that was it. Just the, just the barking part. I, I would love to I would love to play more of this on a DMX, but my God, we are not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. So we, we started, um, we have a little swear jar because oh, some no. of the boys, grade one, um, one of the ones has an older brother, so they've learned all these new bathroom words. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so, it's like, if you say any swears, you have to put, he's got a little piggy bank, um, a quarter in. So now if we hear something, like, he'll just, we are driving and a song came on that had, I don't know what, Kurt, like some, some sort of profanity in it. And he's just in the back seat looking out the window or driving to grandma and gramps' house. And he's like, swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> About three bucks in this Eminem song. Like in this first verse alone. <laughs> yeah. It's tough to, because even the, the rating guide back to, uh, in when we were getting into films, the early 90s and stuff like that, those late 80s films we all loved, weren't rated quite the same as they are now. <laughs> no. Where you could get away with, uh, just generally speaking, is a lot different. I think, speaking of little ears, we gotta go pick our kids up, eh? Yeah, child services has no sense. <laughs> They're not supposed to get them yet. I'm supposed to get them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll leave them in the car with the window cracked. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. Would you come back and do this again sometime? After yeah. after the next movie, or you finished Crit- Camp Cretaceous? Give us a review on that. Pretty early in that one, no spoilers. I yeah, man, for sure. All right. Good to catch up. Cool, for sure. Thanks for thanks for coming on. Well, continued success, man. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Everything you do, I, I'm so excited to see you. The, I, always, I always point to the kids, and they're like, who is this guy? Why? <laughs> 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 All right, man. Me bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get the swear jar going, too. We'll uh, invest in a... <laughs> yeah, just drop a 20, and you're good for a month. We'll be able to advertise during your programming uh, on Global. I can't wait. <laughs> I love it. All right, buddy. Ciao, bud. All right. Special thank you to my buddy Steve for joining us on the podcast. Uh, I'm just blessed for all the people that come in here and and, and join me on on the podcast. This has been incredible. Uh, This week's text is Target of Opportunity, spanning from pages 64 to 68. In a synopsis, Biosyn's board of directors wait impatiently and irritably for a final member to make their emergency meeting, the first they've ever called, so they can reach quorum, and therefore, they must be discussing something very important. Plot points. The nefarious corporate shyster Dr. Lewis Dodgson assembles an emergency meeting of Biosyn's board of directors to notify them that InGen is on the brink of opening the greatest single tourist attraction in the history of the world. There's a fortune to be made, and Biosyn wants some of it for themselves, so they discreetly, off the books agree to perform industrial espionage to get their hands on some of that turn-a-dinosaur-into-a-house-pet technology. Characters. We have the Biosyn Corporation. The Biosyn Corporation is based in Cupertino, California, and has never called an emergency meeting of its board of directors. That said, they're probably a company that's only been around for a couple of years, so it isn't like a multi-generational business that's never had an emergency, but rather a young startup. They're said to be responsible by Bob Morris for the rabies case mentioned earlier in 1986, three years ago in novel time. If that had been such a fiasco as it was described, it's surprising that the board hasn't called an emergency meeting at that point, and that they do it now in the face of an illegal, unethical opportunity rather than in the face of an illegal, unethical emergency is a bit confounding. This, again, feels like something contrived into the plot so that Crichton can show how important this moment is in terms of the plot. They're focusing on developing the product of the 90s, consumer biologicals, and they perform industrial espionage for the purposes of reverse engineering the products. The rabies vaccine test mentioned by Bob Morris from the EPA earlier was conducted by Biosyn and led by Lou Dodson. Their product development team is built around the practice of reverse engineering, tearing apart the competition's products, figuring out how they work, and then making their own version. 
Biosyn has already engineered a new paler trout under contract with the Department of Fish and Game of the state of Idaho. However, the trout often die of sunburn, and reportedly their flesh was soggy and tasteless. After hearing how lucrative the patented dinosaurs are going to be for InGen, the board begins asking about how Biosyn could get a piece of that pie, and quickly. Dr. Lewis Dodson, referred to as Lou, Dr. Dodson is 34 years old. He's balding, hawk-faced, and intense, and he's head of the product development, which he performs by reverse engineering a competitor's products, tearing them apart, learning how they work, and making their own version. He has, quote, trouble with the money men because they invest, but they don't keep up to speed on what's really going on. He answers to Steingarten who insists he has the board of directors approval before executing his plan of industrial espionage for this one. The this one edition suggests that Dodson has done nefarious things before, perhaps it came back to haunt them in the past, and in this case requires more oversight and accountability. He's famously the, quote, most aggressive geneticist of his generation, or the most reckless. He was dismissed by Johns Hopkins as a graduate student for planning gene therapy on human patients without the proper FDA protocols. He conducted the rabies vaccine test in Chile as an officer of Biosyn, which got them negative attention from the EPA. He's placed a lot of attention on InGen for the purposes of industrial espionage. We have Biosyn's board of directors, and that's a group of 11 men, including a fellow named Ron Meyer. Ron Meyer is flying in from San Diego to make the meeting, but he's running a bit late, and when he arrives, they have quorum. Steingarten uh, is the head of Biosyn, who insisted that Dodson get an agreement from the board of directors before executing his plan for industrial espionage. Steingarten appears to be interested in some level of accountability, or at least believes in some system of checks and balances, that Dodson must answer to someone. So this is a meeting where he's asking for permission to perform industrial espionage. InGen. We get a summarized history of InGen from Lou Dodson and a recap of the mysteries that Bob Morris from the EPA was sleuthing over. InGen started up in 1983 with Japanese investors, purchases three Cray XMP supercomputers, the island Isla Nublar from Costa Rica, and stockpiles amber as well as unusual donations to zoos around the world. They also hired researchers with an interest in the past like paleobiologists and DNA phylogeneticists. In 1987, InGen buys Millipore Plastic Products in Nashville, Tennessee, taking its entire output for their own use. At the same time, construction began on their resort, says Dodson. It includes massive earthworks, including a shallow lake two miles long in the center of the island. They're building a private zoo of large dimensions on the island. InGen has built the, quote, greatest single tourist attraction in the history of the world, according to Dodson. And they can charge whatever they want, $2,000 a day, $10,000 a day, and then there is the merchandising, the picture books, t-shirts, video games, caps, stuffed toys, comic books, and pets. The zoo is the centerpiece of an enormous enterprise, says Dodson. Localities, we have Cupertino, California, where the Biosyn Corporation is based. Johns Hopkins, the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine is a private research university in Baltimore, Maryland, which shares a campus with Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins Children's Center, each dating back to the 1800s. This is a highly regarded facility and one that, if you start messing around, they will kick you out, unlike Biosyn. We have some interesting allusions and references in this chapter. Uh, the Supreme Court's Harvard University decision. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Harvard in 1987, which is a real thing, on April 21st in 1987. That was when I was six, and we were celebrating my mom's birthday. The Supreme Court okays patents for new life forms. From this point on, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office could accept patent applications for animals, the first of which was awarded to Harvard University a year later. This was the Onco Mouse, a mouse researchers produced to be especially susceptible to getting cancer. Three decades later, the government has issued about 800 animal patents on everything, says an article I found while researching on this subject at wired.com. An interesting addendum to this illusion is an article found at digitalcommons.law.on.edu, which says there are three common types of people who oppose the patenting of multicellular animal life. One, animal welfare groups concerned about experimentation on laboratory animals. Two, farm groups concerned about the possible domination of animal genetic stock by a limited number of individuals. And three, watchdog groups who are simply opposed to genetic research. The article continues reading, The most vociferous opposition has come from the third category headed by Jeremy Rifkin, a president of the Foundation of Economic Trends. He has spearheaded a coalition of groups, including several animal welfare organizations, and petitioned the Patent and Trademark Office to reverse its newly adopted policy. 
The petition apparently did not make a dramatic impression upon the patent and trademark office because a patent was subsequently issued on a genetically engineered mouse. The strong opinions voiced by these various opponents to animal patenting range from a fear of increased suffering and pain for laboratory mice to a fear of the end of the natural world. Hey, this is starting to sound like Crichton's essay in the introduction, the InGen incident that we covered in episode one. And I'm fairly confident that Crichton was familiar with this Jeremy Rifkin. Another allusion is to the New York Zoological Society. Ham is making unusual donations to the New York Zo Zoological Society. And this is a real society that was chartered in 1895, co-founded by the famous Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was the gentleman who coined the name Tyrannosaurus Rex. That was two other guys we've never heard of. Andrew H. Green and Theodore Roosevelt. Unless, of course, you're from New York or America. In that case, you probably know all about those guys. Uh, we have the Ranthapur Wildlife Park. Uh, InGen is making unusual donations to the Ranthapur Wildlife Park in India, which isn't a real place, but it may be a misspelling of the Rathambore Wildlife Park, which is in India, and is more than 500 square miles in size and has been around since the 1950s. Zoos are extremely popular. More Americans visited zoos than all professional baseball and football games combined, Dodson says on page 67. Is that true? Well, I found the humaneconservation.org's site, and they reference a white paper, which apparently, if you accessed it on March 4th, 2016, would tell you, quote, according to the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, over 181 million people visit U.S. zoos and aquariums it accredits every year, which is more people than go to the NFL, NHL, NBA, and MLB games combined. Globally, 700 million people visit zoos and aquariums every year, or about 10% of the world population. Zoos and aquariums are positioned today not only to take a leading role in conservation, but to educate the next generations about the importance of Earth's animals. So was that also true in the 1980s? I'm going to guess it was. Cray XMP supercomputers. These are real machines designed and built by Cray Research, and the XMP was the 1982 successor to the Cray 1 from 1975, billed as the world's fastest computer with a quad processor system performance of 8,000 M flops, which are mega floating point operations per second. And I guess that's very good. The Sony Walkman. Can you imagine an animal that would have been as popular as the Sony Walkman? Sony built 200 million cassette based Walkmans. They were crushing the market as early as 1979, and Time Magazine said the Walkman's, quote, unprecedented combination of portability, it ran on two AA batteries, and privacy, it featured a headphone jack but no external speaker, made it the ideal product for thousands of consumers looking for a compact, portable stereo that they could take with them anywhere. And The Verge, another publication, added, the world changed on the day the Walkman was released. It's a fitting illusion that biotechnology may be the mother of the next big thing. We also have paler trout, and this is an allusion to something actually presented earlier in the novel, again referencing the introduction, the InGen incident, where Crichton suggested that paler trout were one of the byproducts of this misuse of biotechnology. It was suggested that this might seem like a joke, paler trout, but it assuredly was not. It is implied that this is a misuse of science and that the soggy, tasteless description of the product suggests that it's also a bit of a failure, too. Stylistic techniques. We have what I like to call the ticking time bomb. To drive a story forward, the ticking time bomb is often employed, some deadline that causes characters to race against the clock, which raises tension, suspense, and the stakes. Crichton used this in the I've got a plane to catch moment in the chapter plans, and they're running out of time. And here again in this chapter, a decision must be made now so the source can act within 24 hours. Ultimately, this is Crichton saying, it's now or never, raising the stakes, adding more pressure to drive the plot forward, motivating industrial espionage under the novel's overarching motif of unethical scientific pursuits in the eternally famished quest for profits. Other literary techniques, we have italics. So what? One of the directors is continuing to be impatient, encouraging Dodson to get to the point of the emergency meeting. And they can charge whatever they want, $2,000 a day, $10,000 a day. And then there's the merchandising, the picture books, the t-shirts, video games, caps, stuffed toys, comic books, pets. Here we have italics emphasizing what is, in fact, most lucrative, and that's the merchandising. We have the M dash. Again, Crichton uses the M dash to finish a sentence, implying that a train of thought is being interrupted in the, in the sentence. Biosyn was still working hard on that and M dash. And ellipses, $10,000 a day, ellipses. And then there's the merchandising, suitable for a pause, and it's used for emphasis. 
There wouldn't be anything illegal about it. Ellipses. Again, the unspoken silent ellipses suggests that there's something unspoken, a worry that this shouldn't be done because it is in fact illegal. Uh, and then there's another one here with ellipses. Just a sense of the room as to whether you feel I should proceed. Ellipses. And that space is filled with unspoken communication, which is brilliant. It shows that a sentence is open-ended, that a response is inaudible. And I like that. We also have rhetorical devices. If that was possible, what else is possible? The mastodon? The saber-toothed tiger? The dodo? Or even a dinosaur? All rhetorical devices. Nobody answers that question. <laughs> Let's go on to motifs that keep returning in the, in the story here. We have responsibility and safety. The head of BIOS in Steingarten insists that Dr. Lewis Dodson get the board of directors' of approval on this one, on page 65, suggesting that in the past, Dodson has been irresponsible and now is being held more accountable. In this case, apparently, the entire BOD doesn't care that he's stealing. He requires oversight and to be held accountable, and when those actions are applied, the system fails him. The board of directors permits him bad actions because they can earn lots of money, money that rightfully belongs to the people who earned it. But this also shows that these irresponsible biotechnologies are challenging to contain. Once you let the genie out of the bottle, they get a life of their own. And as the epigraphs remind us, you cannot recall a new form of life. Violation is cause for termination. For the record, when Dodson was messing around with genetics at Johns Hopkins, he was kicked out. So he had been held responsible and accountable before. And this is a highly regarded facility, one that if you start messing around, they will kick you out, unlike Biosyn. The FDA, Federal Drug and Alcohol Agency in the U.S., is an institution that holds people accountable in this chapter as well, like Johns Hopkins. They both level serious consequences to people who violate protocols, which are in this case read to be ethically designed for the protection of others. Heroes and villains, the Biosyn Corporation finally is revealed to be the villainous motivations in this story. More about Lewis Dodson. He was dismissed by Johns Hopkins as a graduate student. So when that happens, you probably don't earn your doctorate, right? Even though he is a doctor, he's Dr. Lewis Dodson. He's called a doctor, so he must have completed his doctorate somewhere else. And I'm, I mean, I don't know. Did he earn an MD or a PhD? Or could he have received both? Well, I don't know. Uh, what else? Let's talk a bit more about cloning dinosaurs in technical literature. Dodson reveals that cloning dinosaurs appeared in, quote, technical literature in 1982, and every year DNA manipulation has grown easier, he says on 67. Egyptian mummies and the quagga are said to have genetic samples extracted from them, and that the future may make cloning other extinct species possible, like a mastodon, a saber-toothed tiger, and the dodo, or even a dinosaur. Cloning is limited only to finding viable DNA, says Dodson's inner monologue on 67. The novel states that fossilization doesn't destroy DNA, as previously assumed, which is world-building. That's not, that's not true, but in, in terms of building a world where dinosaurs can be cloned, um, this is Crichton saying, oh yeah, but in this world it is possible. In a world where DNA doesn't get destroyed during fossilization <laughs> is, is what we got here. Uh, hence the news articles I referenced at the top of this episode. Um, remember, this is a world where scientists have no ethics, science knows no limits, and people are playing with technologies that affect every living thing on Earth, where genetic research continues at a more furious pace than ever, but done in secret, and in haste, and for profit, as stated in the introduction, where biotechnology is whimsically used for maximum profits. So making pygmy dinosaurs as household pets, engineered only to eat in-gen food, is the logical next step here. It kind of reminds me of troll dolls. In general, will be the Russ troll dolls with the cute eyes, a button nose, wild hair, delightful pot belly, and dashing little outfit. And Biosyn will be making the knockoff troll dolls with the stringy hair, unusual off-brand brown-colored skin, and they come up just straight up nude. Uh, money men and teacup dinosaur hunters. Dotson says here he hates waiting on the money men too. Just as Grant has described earlier on page 63, is this an instance where Grant and Dodson should be compared because they have this characteristic in common, or is it just a trope that Crichton is employing almost concurrently? Grant and Dodson are both ambitious geniuses who have to wait for the money men before they can proceed with their future ambitions. That bending a knee to those with money and having to defer to them for their patronage is frustrating. Is there more to unpack here? Obviously, Dodson is a villain and Grant is a hero in this story, but what they have in common may make Dodson a foil of Grant's. It'd mean something if Dodson meant anything past the midway point of this novel, but he disappears. So it's hard to really make a comparison. The money men are the gatekeepers. They are the checks and balances, pun intended. Checks get it. Even Hammond is frustrated with the checks and balances, hence the safety inspection on the island. 
Is this a device Crichton is using to move the plot forward, or perhaps a latent frustration of the author that manifests itself in the work? Who knows? How old are the dinosaurs on the island? Remember back in 1987 when we started to build the containment devices on page 122? That's what we're told. They were building containment devices in 1987. There were no grown adults at that point. We also learned that they bought millipore plastics in Nashville, Tennessee in 1987 and switched its entire output for their own use. So this suggests that InGen could have been using different eggs or just been a customer of millipore plastics prior to 1987. And so that, in that case, they could have been using the eggshells before that. And then so after they bought it, they consumed its entire production. And while this doesn't give us a particularly firm date, we can figure that they were cloning the first dinosaurs before this, before 1987, anyhow. Quorum. There are 11 men who comprise quorum for the Biosyn Corporation. Quorum is technically just the minimum quantity of voters required to make a binding decision for the, for the corporation. But what that minimum number is can vary. In some cases, it's only a third. In some, it's 50% plus one. So given that there are 11 board members present and they required that final person to make quorum, the odd number of directors suggests that the final attendee is taking them from 50% to 50% plus one. So that means that there is probably about 20 board members of Biosyn. That feels like a lot. I hear between 8 and 12 is pretty common. Genetech, the company founded in Crichton's introduction, has 9. In this novel, we're told quorum is so important that it'll silence a boardroom full of impatient and irritable di directors. Here, a quorum means they're going to be asked to make an important decision. Just seems like a big board of directors, that's all. Directors' duties. In general, the board sets broad policies and makes important decisions as a fiduciary on behalf of the company and its shareholders. Issues that fall under a board's purview include mergers and acquisitions, dividends and major investments, as well as the hiring and firing of senior executives and their compensation. An emergency meeting may be called to discuss business or take action that cannot be delayed for the 48 hour notice usually required to call a meeting of the board of directors. In such a meeting, they can only make decisions on emergency matters. These are done with little planning or in a time of crisis. If Bob Morris from the EPA is to be believed, the rabies fiasco from 1986 that Lewis Dodson was involved in didn't warrant an emergency meeting, which is terrifically unusual. The board at that time would likely have said, given the bad press, to fire the principals involved and change leadership or something like that, but they didn't. I guess they didn't have an emergency meeting in that they could wait 48 hours before they took action? I don't know. Responsibility and safety. Leadership isn't their strength. At Biosyn, nobody wants to go on the record for approving the industrial espionage course of action on page 68. Nobody wants to be held accountable. There's no leadership here. There's no responsibility being taken. This kind of connects us to the, the trope of never helping mankind. Later on in the novel, John Hammond's famously going to tell Dr. Wu that investing in bioengineering to help people is fraught with regulations, protocols, and you can't make as much money, whereas entertainment is the field where you can charge as much money as you'd like. And Biosyn is in fundamental alignment with InGen. Given a few years, they could have survived quite nicely together through a corporate merger. They're looking for a biological equivalent of the Sony Walkman, something trendy that everybody can't wait to get their hands on. These companies weren't interested in pharmaceuticals or health. They were interested in entertainment, sports, leisure activities, cosmetics, and pets in consumer biologicals. And consumer biologicals is the same term that Hammond used in his pachyderm portfolio speech, as mentioned by Gennaro, back on page 59. So these are two businesses probably could have merged quite successfully. They appear to be made of the same stuff. Uh, we have another little uh, observation we can include in our, our cataloging of uh, items that we can put in our ecological criticism. Here we have different, a different perspective on ecology, but in this case it's on animal rights. Uh, the dinosaurs are confirmed to be patentable, and an allusion is made to the Supreme Court's ruling in the Harvard decision that animals can be patented, and that was ruled in 1987. In terms of building a mystery, Dodson solves the mystery. All the wonderful things that we were, were so curious about is answered. InGen is cloning dinosaurs, but a few items are yet unresolved, like what is the amber for? Where is InGen getting the DNA from? Those two are still sticking out. Otherwise, the XMP supercomputers, what he's doing on the island, things like that, all of that has been addressed. Crichton always has some mystery percolating. As soon as some questions are answered, new questions are raised. And more importantly, Crichton makes a point to answer the, these questions. These are premeditated plot points which motivate the characters through the novel. 
Well, hope you like this episode. It's kind of a strange chapter. Uh, kind of just sticks out like a sore thumb in a way, but it's a really important part of, uh, you know, getting our conflict moving in the story. More importantly, I hope that you really enjoyed our my special guest today, Steve Bull. Steve, thanks for coming on. What a wonderful time to, to catch up with you again. <laughs> and hearing about your real-life version of the fisherman's friend commuting to work in the early morning. I want to sign up today also thanking you for joining me. If you want to read along in the book, add some thoughts to what we've been discussing on the show, or be a guest on this show, and chat with me about anything you like about Jurassic Park, you can do that by connecting with me. I'm at ryansrogers at gmail.com. If you'd like to be a guest, you can drop me a line and we can try and set something up. We can rehash and tear down and gush over and chit-chat about any part of the book, or also not the book, all you'd like. Jurassic Park cast is part of the Spring Chickens banner of amateur intellectual properties, including the Spring Chickens funny pages, Tomb of the Undead graphic novel, the Second Lapse graphic novelettes, the infantry, and the worst of them all, the King Street capers. You can find links to all that baggage in the show notes, or by visiting the schickens.blogspot.com, or finding us on Facebook at facebook.com slash springchickencapers, or me, I'm on Twitter at rogersryan22. Thank you dearly for tuning into the Jurassic Park cast. The Jurassic Park podcast, where we talk about the novel Jurassic Park, and also not that too. Until next time.